All right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to today's live Google Hangout, sponsored by Architecture and Governance Magazine and EA Directions, with the support, registration, and production provided by our friends at True Technologies. Uh, my name is George Paris, and I'm the editor in chief of Architecture and Governance Magazine, and also a mentor for enterprise architects and their IT and business colleagues, working to help them bring EA concepts to life in their organizations. Um, I am pleased today to have the opportunity to host and moderate today's panel discussion on an important development in the EA profession. Uh, in our most recent issue, A&G had the opportunity to introduce the first initiative of the Federation of Enterprise Architecture Professional Organizations, also known as FIPO, uh, on a paper titled A Common Perspective on Enterprise Architecture. And it has since stirred a great deal of interest in the industry uh, as much, if not more, to due to the breadth of membership and the collaborative way it was produced, uh, even more so than its content. For today's session, we have invited members of the Board of Directors of FIPO to join us for this Hangout to discuss their organization, their paper, and the approach they use to create it. To begin, I'd like to welcome President of FIPO, Brian Cameron, and Board Members Richard Martin and Andy Chen. Brian, let's start with you. Can you take a moment to introduce yourself to our viewers? Sure, it's a pleasure to be here, George. Um, I'm Brian Cameron. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Enterprise Architecture at the Pennsylvania State University, and as George uh, mentioned, I'm the founding president of FIPO. Um, you can read more about our center and more about me at our center website at ea.ist.psu.edu. All right, Richard, next up, can you introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I've been involved in information systems for about 40 years now. Um, I've had a particular interest in architecture, uh, primarily as a result of my work with the International Organization for Standardization, where I chair a working group on architecture and modeling in the uh, automation systems uh, area. I also have been involved with INCOSI, the International Council on Systems Engineering, and that led me uh, into the uh, collaborative effort with Brian and many others to create uh, FIPO several years ago. Great, thanks Richard. Uh, and how about you Andy? Hi, I'm Andy Chen. Um, I am mostly, most of my careers are in uh, power industries and I uh, um, at one point I held as the Vice President in charge of Enterprise Strategy and Architectures for a major a utility company in Ontario, Canada. Um, I retired as a CTO for the company uh, about five years ago. I started getting involved uh, in um, uh, Archibald Computer Societies. Uh, some work I do with them to professionalize the IT disciplines. Um, from there, I sprang up to uh, become the founding member organizations with people. Um, I've been there since day one, uh, collaborating with Brian and Richard and a couple of the board members. Um, my, uh, my thought to the table is um, I've done the, some enterprise um, architecture uh, for a company with some experience. I'd like to bring that uh, to the table with the rest of the group uh, to give a real uh, industrial view of the enterprise uh, aspect. Um, so that's what I contribute to the group. Um, that's it for me. All right. Thanks, Andy. Um, to get started, um, I'd like to throw the first question over to Brian. Um, and since there's people on the line who may not know very much about FIPO, why don't you take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about it and why the organization was founded? Okay, great. FIPO is a unique organization globally. Uh, the uh, idea for FIPO um, originated uh, well over four years ago. As I was forming the Center for Enterprise Architecture at Penn State, uh, I was invited to be on different uh, working groups and boards of many different professional organizations uh, that either uh, represent the profession as a whole or represent pieces of the profession, business architecture groups, state architecture groups, et cetera. And what I saw from this unique vantage point was that, uh, A, there was a lot of good work being done out there, but B, there was also a lot of reinvention of the wheel and a lot of duplication of uh, some uh, very f fundamental efforts for the professions. For example, um, uh, one group would come out with their set of competency standards for the profession and any other groups that weren't involved in that effort would come out with their com competing set of standards 
and it left the profession, in my opinion, very fragmented and confusing for the practitioner. There was no one clear leader uh, uh, advancing the profession forward. One of our goals at Penn State is to help enterprise architecture evolve into, quote, a real profession someday on par with established professions like accounting, engineering, et cetera. And I think we all agree we've got quite a bit of work to do before that, that day gets here. And in our opinion, if the uh, industry didn't um, uh, decrease the fragmentation and come together, that day may be a long time in the making or, or may never arrive. So I uh, decided to try to do something about this uh, fragmentation and invited representatives from the six larger professional organizations that were involved in our center at Penn State to kind of a summit meeting at Penn State to lay out the, the problems I see with advancing the profession, the need to put more of one face to the profession and come to consensus on some issues needed to really ad advance and evolve the profession. So what came from this initial meeting was the concept of FIPO, this organization of organizations, organization of professional organizations, almost a United Nations, if you will, for this space, to, to bring the, the, the different players together and uh, collaborate on efforts, uh, consolidate some efforts in some cases, and jointly uh, push the profession forward. Um, we started with the uh, six initial organizations. We're now up to 17 and counting. We'll uh, soon be over 20 organizations worldwide. It, it's amazing how quickly this has grown. It's, I think it's an idea whose time has come. And within the VIPO organization, um, it's become kind of a united, we stand, divided, who knows uh, how this profession is going to progress in the future. So we, we've um, come a long way in a short period of time. We've uh, met some major milestones, got through some major um, and initial uh, uh, hurdles, if you will, bringing all these groups together and getting them to establish a rapport with one another and est establish a certain trust level uh, took some time. And now we've got a very uh, unique community. Uh, it's, all, and it's credit to people like Richard and Andy. We've got great people from uh, representing our member organizations that have really established a relationship with one another and have really uh, uh, come together to really uh, uh, evolve the profession. And I, we've got, I, I think, uh, a great group of talented people here for the right reasons, and I'm really looking forward to the next year. Oh, that's great. Um, Brian, I know you came at this from, you know, your, your, your seat at Penn State and the activities you were working on there, but I'd like to kick it over to Richard and Andy. Um, you guys you know, touched on this a little bit in your introduction, but what brought you specifically and your perspectives into the, the FIPO organization? You know, what, what excited you about it and got you involved? Uh, let me, you know, either one of you first. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, um, I have been involved with uh, issues in architecture, both in manufacturing and information systems through my work with uh, International Organization for Standardization and through uh, uh, work with INCOSI, I uh, participated in uh, work that INCOSI has relative to the uh, preparation of some ISO standards. Uh, INCOSI also has an architecture working group that I've been involved in. Um, so that uh, the idea of taking the professional uh, background of the engineering groups in the systems engineering uh, community into this area of enterprise architecture was kind of a natural evolution of things that, that uh, I felt needed to occur. Uh, and that's, that's how I kind of moved into that space. Uh, I've been working in the area of architecture for about 25 years, so uh, I had quite a diversity of background. Also, the background that I have is more focused on automation systems that are not necessarily information systems. So there's manufacturing and uh, kinds of systems that are involved, which have been doing uh, essentially enterprise architecture for the last 150 years. So they have a different perspective about what enterprise architecture is than those who have been brought up in this uh, more uh, uh, recent use of uh, enterprise architecture in the IT context. Great. How about you, Andy? Sorry, um, I just dropped off for a minute. Could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, the, the, I was just sort of interested, you mentioned this a little bit in your um, introductory comments, but what, you, what brought you personally into FIPO? What was it uh, about what you heard at that first summit meeting that excited you and, um, and, and made you want to bring your perspectives into the mix? Yeah, so I think that the, bit, the, the uh, thing that drew me to it is um, having a, a lot of different organizations um, in different aspects of it. 
um, there is a data aspect, um, there is business aspect, um, there is um, many different aspects of the organization get together trying to figure out what enterprise uh, architecture is. And for personally, I'm more on the business side, the more of um, uh, applying on the employer side view of the organizations. Um, and for me, I think that's a great uh, side end into uh, the group to try to find out how the academic sees it, how the uh, uh, practitioner sees it, e eventually how the employee sees it. Uh, so that's what drew me to it, uh, to collaborate with the group. Great. Well, you know, um, I, I am dying to ask a question that uh, that really did, wasn't a part of our pre-meeting conversation, and, and I actually think I'm going to take the chance to do this. Uh, you hinted at it a little bit, Brian, in your opening comments, so I, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to this. But the dynamic of bringing all of these organizations with their different perspectives together must have been, um, I'll say, entertaining to begin with. Um, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that, and, and if you've, any of you have an opportunity to share, you know, because these kinds of organizations really do have an interesting dynamic. They do, George, and we actually did our homework. Uh, there have been efforts like this tried in other industries, and they've always failed. And the reason they failed, uh, by and large, is because it was always one of the larger organizations approaching the smaller, and they were always met with, you know, suspicion, mistrust, and then never got very far. In this case, we had a university uh, as, as the, the Switzerland in the middle of the United Nations, if you will. Uh, and, you know, for, and I don't do this so much anymore, but in the early days, I was doing a lot of troubleshooting between organizations and different personalities and you know, put, trying to put out a lot of fires um, behind the scenes. Uh, now we've got a level of trust built and, and rapport between the groups that you know, I find myself having to do that with less and less. But you're right. Uh, I was told by many people, um, a, a, you'll never get them together. Uh, and so once we got them together, well, you'll never keep them together. Uh, and the, well, then when they stay together, well, you'll never get them to do anything productive. Uh, and now that for our perspective paper was, I think, our first uh, showing that we can get this group together, have them agree on some foundational issues to advance the profession and we can and we'll talk about the paper you know it was far from unanimous there was a lot of negotiation as you might expect but in the end we came together and agreed on something that we could live with and I think that's the key to this group we're never going to get perfection we're never going to get a hundred percent agreement on anything but if we can get something that everybody's okay with to put out there then we've I think we've really helped to advance the profession and, and we're at that point now that's good because <clears throat> in the you, you sort of set up the next question in your comments, which, um, you know, to, to help an organization like this come together, you have to rally around a particular purpose. And um, so, so tell me a little bit about, you know, sort of the way you conceived your, your major initiatives and, and how are you viewing the, the work activities? What, what is the sequence of events that you guys are pursuing? And, and then we'll clearly talk about the first project that you guys uh, produced the results on. Well, and and uh, to, to lead into that, I should probably explain a little bit more about the nature of people for people that are just hearing about it for the first time. So this is an organization of organizations. So the the only currently the only members of people are appointed representatives from our member organizations, and they're the people that have the vote in the direction of the organization. So even though I am the, the president and pulled these folks together, I don't vote. I represent a university, not 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 a professional organization. Um, and the idea behind FIPO is not to um, compete with our members. We're not going to offer certifications or anything of that nature. I get that question a lot. But rather someday, if we're successful with this, is be, um, for lack of a better term, an accrediting body for the, for the profession, which we really need. Um, there's a lot of fly-by-night certifications out there. People can slap the term on just about anything they want, and there's nobody out there to say whether that's good, bad, or somewhere in the middle. Same with universities. You can slap the term on any type of course or program you want and there's really nobody out there to uh, to say whether that's good, bad, or, or uh, otherwise. So eventually um, uh, we hope to be the accrediting body to set some professional standards. We'll talk about our career path initiative that we're kicking off and, and eventually have the FIPO endorsement mean something in the profession so that if you look at a certification or curriculum or what anything else and it has the FIPO endorsement, that means it's been vetted by this organization 
it does what it says it's going to do. It's representing things properly, and this this organization has decided to endorse it. Almost like the underwriter's laboratory. You know, when you see the UL symbol, you know it's been that product's been tested meets certain quality standards. I think we really need that in this profession to to advance it. So that's that's one of the the ideas behind FIFO. So you, you asked about some of our current initiatives. Uh, the paper which we're going to talk about today, uh, that was a version one. We we have we have a group that's forming to work on version two of the paper. No, nobody's going to pretend that that paper is perfect by any means. It was version one, something we could all live with and agree with and put out as the first version. We want to enhance it, uh, collect feedback and enhance it and come out with the version two in the next year. Another major initiative that we just kicked off is a career pathing uh, initiative. We've been asked by many organizations, you know, can you give us some guidance on forming our career paths internally for different types of EA-related professionals? And there's really no guidance out there. Most organizations do the best they can, put together their own internal career paths, usually with some type of internal certifications. But the issue we have with that is that you can't compare them. They're very different in, in, in their nature, and you can't compare a bronze-level architect from Oracle from, with a level three architect from Raytheon. They just don't translate back and forth. We need to get past all of this. I realize why all of that was done out of necessity, but we really need to get some more common standards and common understanding to, to have a real profession. So that's what we're kicking off in FIFO an international effort to define what's the core of this profession, what does it look like, how's it structured, and what are the related roles and competencies and possible career progressions. Big effort, it's going to take us you know, uh, some time to pull this together and agree on it, but it, it's really needed and um, I think this organization is the right organization to take something like this on. So, so Andy, Brian um, mentioned the, the next couple of years and the set of initiatives out there. Where do you see the organization heading you know, what's the timing? Uh, you know, Brian said it's going to take some time. How does that timing shape up for you guys? So there's a couple aspects that I think the organization is going to grow. Um, I think um, the organization actually is an international organization. We are members uh, from uh, Australia. We're members from British uh, uh, England and um, Britain um, and among other countries. Um, they are collaborating with us. So. I think more of just expanding out to just North America, but globally trying to reach out because uh, it is applicable worldwide. Uh, these issues that we're facing with um, the other the other aspect of it is uh, trying to integrate it with the uh, academics aspect of it, the research academic part. Um, most of these organizations right now are organizations of societies like ourselves, um, electrical engineers. Uh, computer societies uh, or system engineers and different other uh, disciplines. Um, so what I see is that there's going to be expanding to more towards collaborating with the uh, academics uh, as well as the organizations. Uh, Richard, Brian, anything let to me, add me, to that? Let me add something that uh, kind of got glossed over here a little bit. Um, as a, as a, an organization of organizations, we have structured the governance of FIPO in such a way that no organization or collective of organizations, if you might, can actually uh, direct what's happening in FIPO. Uh, there is very limited opportunity for um, any organization, a single organization, to kind of take control and move us in a particular direction. And because of the, the way we are structured, many of the organizations that are participating in FIPO have to work together for us to make progress. So nobody can kind of step out and say, I'm going to do this and all you guys can follow. The, the organization cannot support that kind of effort. It can only support collaborative efforts among the professionals that are involved. And I think that's one of the real strengths going forward. And for FIPO to, proceed, if, to succeed, we're going to have to continue that collaborative effort. And I think that the perspectives paper is one result of that. I think the uh, work on a career path is going to be another um, step in that direction. But it does require that many of the organizations who are members get involved and participate. We, that, that, that's essential, an essential aspect of the organization. And I think it's probably its greatest strength. If I could pick up on that comment as well, um, we have uh, 
many other initiatives. We have a very robust and aggressive roadmap of activities. Richard's actually um, an integral part of a taxonomy working group that we have within FIPO, uh, trying to bring together the different taxonomies and perspectives from our different member organizations, and they're doing fabulous work. Um, so we've got many different working groups, all on pretty aggressive timelines. I mean, the profession, in our opinion, can't wait you know, five years for this stuff. We've mentioned the career path. We're, we're trying to get uh, a straw man out for a su summit meeting we're having on the profession in June to have some straw man work for us to tear apart when we come together face to face. And as Richard uh, mentioned, uh, our one of our big constraining factors right now, we need more people involved. Uh, we've got so many different possible initiatives and um, we need to get a uh, more people from our member organizations and other, otherwise involved in these initiatives to, to push them forward. And we're getting a lot of great interest. I, I think that that'll happen as we become more known and, and people see that this group is, is really uh, poised to, to make a difference in the profession. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think the way people are going to see it is, is a byproduct of the work that you produce. And uh, yeah. Richard, you mentioned the, the paper. Um, and I know many people who've joined this this uh, uh, hangout this morning are interested in hearing about that paper itself and, and how it came about. So, uh, Richard, why don't you tell us about the, the common perspective of enterprise architecture paper? You know, we, we've kind of covered a little bit about the reasoning, but, you know, how did it shape out? How did you decide what was going to be covered and not covered? You know, how, what was the genesis of that and, and the way it unfolded? Okay, let me kind of give you a history of, of what happened. Uh, in February of 2000, I believe it was February of 2012, uh, we had a meeting of the membership that occurred at um, uh, the IEEE uh, facilities in Los Alamitos, California. And one of the ideas that came out of that meeting was that we needed something that uh, we could present so that people who were not in the um, profession of enterprise architecture or working in the domain of enterprise architecture could get a sense of what enterprise architecture was all about. And uh, we decided that uh, the, the initial part would be to then uh, conduct a survey of our members to see what kind of questions we should be asking uh, so that we could prepare a paper which was really targeting non-EA professionals. Uh, the result of that was a list of questions uh, that were, were prepared and again sent back to each of the members for their uh, um, response to the questions. Many of the uh, member organizations actually solicited input from a number of their particular members. All of that information was gathered together. It turned out to be about 40, 42 pages of responses to those questions. And that was synthesized into a, uh, a first draft paper of about uh, 35 pages, so we didn't cut much out at that point. Uh, we then uh, did a review and feedback on that first draft. Uh, we also had a, uh, conducted a summit um, uh, in uh, a Penn State facility where we had about 40 people in the room talking about that paper, what it should address, the orientation that should it, that it should take to its audience. Uh, we worked through some of the major issues that we had, uh, deciding some things that, need, that just couldn't go in the paper at this point, others that needed to be elaborated. Uh, we then created another draft which was reviewed. Uh, we had another meeting in Chicago where we went through parts of that draft and what should be updated and modified in it, and then produced a, a third draft which was then sent out to each of the member organization delegates uh, requesting a, a yay or nay vote out of them uh, given that uh, as Brian said this was our kind of uh, what we could agree to at this point and it's our first cut not necessarily the final say uh, but something which we could all point to and say this is our best uh, estimate of what how we should be presenting enterprise architecture to a broader audience. Uh, the paper is is rather progressive in many ways because the kinds of enterprise architecture activities that it describes are uh, sometimes not common in some of the um, uh, subdomains of enterprise architecture activity. Uh, some of them, uh, and I don't think that there is any organization within uh, FIPO that's entirely satisfied with it. There is more work to be done. Um, but it, as it turns out, every 
one of the member organizations that took a look at that third draft agreed that it was a suitable product for FIPO to put out uh, as our uh, first um, attempt to try and summarize for a non-professional audience what enterprise architecture was all about. And I want to thank ANG Magazine for uh, publishing that. Uh, this is something that we thought needed to be done, and it launches us with an ability to have a referenced work that we can then cite on Wikipedia pages and in other uh, publications from our member organizations. So I want to thank you very much for that. Well, you're welcome. Um, we we appreciate the opportunity to uh, to have taken a, taken part in that, and uh, you know certainly uh, we know there's a lot of feedback, and people are are actively out there looking at the paper. Um, so, but before we move on, uh, Brian, I, I, Richard said something interesting about the progressive nature of the paper, and, and this may take us off track for a little bit, but I think it might be interesting. What were the surprises from your survey? Um, what kinds of things did you not expect on the way in that came about through this conversation? And you know, and that's open to any of you to answer. Uh, great question, and I, I want to uh, answer your question. But first, I want to. Uh, uh, point out something that, that Richard alluded to in his comments. To, to me, there was a bigger picture behind this paper than the content of the paper itself. Uh, Richard mentioned a, a summit meeting we had at Penn State to discuss the paper. This was far from unanimous. Uh, there was a lot of heated debate. We actually got to the point where we had to vote on different issues. So for me, the paper was a make or break for the FIPO concept, whether this was actually going to work or not. Would people who were in the minority opinion take their marbles and go home? Because uh, we see that a lot in this space, P people that you know, if if, if uh, your point's not agreed with you, you leave the conversation. Uh, that didn't happen here. Uh, we voted. The people that were in the minority accepted uh, that th their points might be addressed later in a later version, but it wasn't going to get put into the, the current version. And it was a very respectful discussion. There was there was uh, like I said, debate, but respectful debate. And, and in the end, every as Richard mentioned, everybody uh, voted positively on the paper. So I think that's a real testament to the people we brought together and that, that this type of uh, activity and organization can work and does work. Now, now to your point, surprises that were brought up. Wow. Uh, where do we begin? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Guys, jump in here if you want. I think, I think the biggest surprise was the, 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 the realization of just how broad the domain of enterprise architecture is in terms of the practice, which uh, is now going on around the world. I mean, it, it spans an enormous range of activities in different organizations. Well, and a lot of very different perspectives on what it is, from a very IT-centric, traditional perspective to more of an enterprise-wide you know, uh, perspective as well, which I think is, is becoming more the predominant perspective, but, but not universally embraced. And a lot of debate, and um, you know, as Richard mentioned, we had a very long paper at the beginning and got a whole host of feedback on this paper, some positive, some negative, and then we looked for common trends and tried to synthesize across the best we could. And, um, you know, th there's just, a, as Richard mentioned, a whole range of uh, opinions and perspectives on what EA is. So trying to synthesize that down to something we all could live with what was a challenge. And, um, you know, I, I think the, su the surprise for me, if, if anything, was, um, well, it wasn't, I wasn't necessarily surprised, but... Uh, just how much how, how much synthesis we had to do. In some cases, um, you know, there there was some overlap, but not a lot of overlap, and a lot of uh, discussion on points. Uh, I I I uh, sometimes say this is almost like uh, getting a bill through Congress. So we had to have discussions on. We realized this is your point, but here's what the majority of the group are saying. Can you live with this? So uh, a lot of those type of discussions. So the amount of time that went in to achieving the consensus, I think, was um, maybe so, uh, more than I was expecting, uh, but, but well worth the time. Well, I, you know, I certainly applaud you all for, uh, for the level of enthusiasm and activity. Being someone familiar with standards groups and organizations going way back, you know, they, many of them have a somewhat jaded history of, of not being able to play nice together. So it's quite refreshing, uh, particularly as something as big and broad as enterprise architecture, to, to reach at least a consensus opinion like this.
Um, one of the biggest, most interesting parts of, of the paper that I found and, and that I think about the enterprise architecture profession, and you allude to it, and, and maybe this is going to be part of a future um, work activity, but it's the very interconnectedness of the enterprise architecture discipline to everything else that gets done from portfolio management and governance and leadership and strategy formulation. You know, you do pay a little attention to that in the, in the paper and you introduce those concepts, but uh, I'm wondering will those kinds of discussions come up in future drafts or will it be an entirely different initiative? Any to, yet to be determined. <laughs> Great. I, I think we will be addressing many of these. The, the focus now is going to shift a little bit into the, uh, the career path effort. Uh, it's just one of how many people we can get involved in doing things. And these, these efforts are significant. And you, for a, an organization which is essentially depending on volunteers who are being volunteered by other organizations, uh, there's we, there's only so much bandwidth that we have available. The focus is now going to shift somewhat to the career path, but we are going to have a, a continuing effort to look at the issues that the paper has raised and uh, those um, comments that we received early on that kind of got shed as we were going along as being secondary to what we felt was the primary mission of the paper, which has to be remembered to be towards non practicing professionals. Mm -hmm. So uh, we haven't addressed necessarily the issues that practicing pr uh, EA professionals have to address on an ongoing basis. So that, that whole area is still uh, for us to, to, to tackle at some point in time. Well, you know, Andy, Brian mentioned earlier the idea of a, of a version two, uh, and obviously with recognition, Richard, you're focused on a lot of the career path activities. Um, you know, Andy, what, what do you see as version two? How is that shaping up and, and where is that headed? What are the future plans for the paper? Um, and, and how do people get involved in the evolution of the paper? Yeah, so um, we have now organized um, a, um, a working group uh, that will be focusedly uh, working with our communication group, uh, focused on the draft two of the document. And uh, we have a chap by the name of Eric Sweeten. Um, uh, he is um, heading the effort uh, uh, coming by, coming out to uh, uh, consolidate the feedback uh, that we receive on various channels. Um, and having the work group and, and recruiting uh, different part of the organization's volunteers to start working on the different aspects of the Rev2. Um, the best way to, uh, to get involved is to look up our website, which is www.feeple.org. Um, in there, uh, there will be articles, there will be channel there for you to submit um, uh, what your interests are um, and um, how you'd like to get involved. And there's contact information there as well. If you do that, uh, one of us will get back um, to you and explain to you um, how you can get involved. But basically, like we said before, this is an organization of organization. You have to belong to an organization which is uh, part of the feeble organization's um, uh, members. So um, you can go through one of our members' um, uh, organizations or um, you can contact us and we'll figure out if we can use you as uh, the resources to help advance it. So either way, we will try to encourage as much participation as possible. Great. Well, I'm sure that the industry is looking forward to it. You know, not to give away any secrets, uh, just based on the work done to date, you know, what's bubbling to the top of the, you know, the focus area of the second paper? And, uh, and if I've overstepped my bounds, let me know. <laughs> well, we're in the process of collecting feedback, so we haven't synthesized the feedback yet. So far, um, I think the, the feedback, by and large, has been pretty positive. Um, you know, I, I, again, we're still collecting feedback from our member organizations, but, you know, I think there'll be some changes made. Do I think it's going to be a drastic shift in the position of the paper? No. Um, but, by and large, uh, I think so far the feedback's been been. Uh, overwhelmingly positive. So um, until we get gather more feedback and synthesize it, it's tough to say if there's any uh, major trends for for changing the paper at this point. 
Yeah, would it be so much changes in refinement or expansion? Uh, I think it's going to be determined by the feedback and what we hear. If we start hearing things over and over again that you really need to expand in this direction or that direction, uh, we'll, we'll uh, consider that. Uh, if we don't hear a uh, call for a major expansion, something we missed or something that needs to be done to enhance it, then you know it may just be tweaking around the edges. Okay. I expect uh, one of the, the, uh, the things that will happen is there will be a call to identify more of the methods and techniques that are being used by enterprise architects. Um, this is the part of that shift from a perspectives paper which is addressing non-practicing professionals, non-EA professionals, to a paper which is uh, coming closer to addressing um, EA professionals to help them improve their practice. Uh, so I think version 2 is probably going to move more toward uh, the statements about uh, the nature of the practice and how we can improve the practice rather than uh, an explanation of what the practice is for non-practitioners. I think well, that, that probably will occur. And it could be that that paper, we've discussed this um, uh, periodically, uh, there were a lot of different ideas for papers that, that percolated through this process. So what Richard just described may become its own paper and maybe not a version two of this paper. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to figure that out based on the feedback on where we cut this paper off and where we start developing all the related, uh, more uh, detailed and drill down related papers that, that came from this process. And there, there are many. Yeah, well, the landscape is huge. I mean, the, the, as you said earlier, Richard, the, the, the EA discipline is vast. Uh, it is, uh, you know, my comment, interconnected to many things, and there's many different nuances, everything from the practitioner level up to the leadership level uh, that need to come to bear. And, and um, you had mentioned a little bit earlier that you were looking into taxonomy work as well. I don't know if that was you or... Um, yeah, or that's, that's me. Let me... Let me um move this in a little bit direction. One of the challenges to developing EA as a profession is this vast landscape that you're talking about. For most professions, uh, they, they tend to, to focus in a domain area uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the accounting domain, for example, uh, where we've got uh, hundreds of years of practice and standards to go on. Uh, but there, there's the, the, the domain is generally fairly uh, confined. With enterprise architecture, it's hard to determine where the boundary of that profession is. And that becomes part of the challenge we have as an organization going forward in trying to make enterprise architecture a real profession. Yep. Um, we're just about out of time now. I'd like to, uh, to kind of go around our panelists one, one last time to see if you have any um, sort of concluding remarks or final comments. Uh, Andy, uh, any thoughts from you at this point? Yeah, the what, what I would like to to, uh, to express to everybody is that um, uh, the CIPO organization um, is growing, and we're getting a lot of positive feedbacks, and it is a very uh, worthwhile cause for everybody to uh, to get in and get involved. So I, I encourage the, the listeners out there uh, to contact us and to start finding more about this uh, new uh, exciting development we have under Enterprise Architectures. Right. Richard, how about you? Um, I think I'd you know, kind of say ditto to what Andy was saying, that, that one of the, uh, the difficulties with any organization which depends on volunteers is getting enough volunteers to do all of the, the, the work that's necessary and uh, fruitful. Uh, we would like to harvest more work which has been done in other places. Uh, if possible, to uh, uh, bring it in so that so we can give it exposure. Uh, we would like to get people to participate so that we can benefit from the knowledge that they have and their enthusiasm for enterprise architecture as well. All right, and Brian, I'll give you the last word. Okay. Andy mentioned how to find out more about the organization and get involved at our website, www.feedpo.org. Also, um, we are... Um, in the process of planning uh, an annual event, which we're calling a summit on the enterprise architecture profession. This isn't a, an open conference, but rather an event that we're going to do, in, uh, at least for, uh, for the foreseeable future, on an annual basis, where we bring the FIBO members together and invited guests to tackle the current issue that we're working on that, this year. So last year, as Richard mentioned, we did it at Penn State. 
We had uh, over 40 people in attendance of so FIFO delegates and invited guests. Uh, True was one of the sponsors of the event. We want to thank them for their sponsorship. This year, the focus of the summit is going to be on the career path effort. So the idea is that we have straw man documents developed and we get together to do things that we just can't do virtually. The things that we have to hash out, vote, you know, struggle with, go back and forth on. This year, the, the, the topic is the career path effort. Next year, we don't know yet. Uh, whatever major effort we're working on to push the profession forward where we need to come together and bring in thought leaders from outside of people as invited guests to contribute to the discussion. So it's uh, it's turning into a very popular uh, annual event. We already have sponsored, pe uh, people that would like to sponsor it at their locations uh, this coming spring. So stay tuned for more information on that event as well. And again, we'd like to thank A&G Magazine for all of their support and for True as well for, for their support uh, of our efforts. And right. we look forward to, to hearing from many of you in the future. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Um, I'd like to, to thank Brian, Richard, and Andy for uh, their time this morning and for their uh, tireless efforts in supporting these initiatives. And, and I know you guys aren't alone. Uh, you know, there's many other board members who were not able to attend uh, this particular uh, hangout this morning. And I know you have all the member organizations as well. So I, I want to pass my thanks off to all of them as well. Um, Richard made a comment about volunteers and this being a volunteer organization, as did Andy. Uh, I would also like to uh, give a little plug for Architecture and Governance magazine. Um, all of our contributed articles are done on a volunteer basis as well, and we're always looking for new and interesting perspectives from the practitioner community, from the end user communities, from, from vendors and so forth. So if you uh, feel uh, motivated to write, um, please uh, consider submitting an article to Architecture and Governance magazine. There's information at www.architectureandgovernance.com uh, with submission guidelines and the details about the process. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to mention that this uh, Hangout is going, uh, was recorded and is going to be available um, on the Google Plus home or the Google Plus page as well as the YouTube channel and more information will be uh, available out there and you'll see this popping up in a variety of different places. Uh, with that I'd like to thank my colleagues at, at ANG, um, my partner at EA Directions for um, their support and help in putting this event together. Uh, True in particular, um, this is the first time we've used the uh, the Google Hangout vehicle, and uh, it's been a real learning experience. And, and True has gone above and beyond the uh, the fray here, figuring out the mechanics of making all of this work. Uh, so, with that, I would uh, like to bring us to conclusion and uh, sign off for the day. So, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you. you.